Okay, so now let's move from getting a good map to um, trying to do something with that map. And in this case, we're going to um, try to build a model into map. And we'll also, we're also going to find the map symmetry, which is going to take one second. So let's do those two things. Um, and we're going to do a new tutorial. Uh, no, we're going to use this pretty much the same information from this tutorial. Um, uh, because this one was already density modification model building. Okay, so we don't need to, to make a new one. Sorry about that. We're going to scroll down a little bit farther. And we did um, all these things. And okay, so, so we did density modification. We looked at the map. Um, now let's use another little tool. It's a really handy um, little tool um, called a map box that lets you cut out pieces of a map. And the reason to do this is basically that it's easy to work with small pieces of a map, much easier than working with the whole thing, just because everything is way quicker and uses much less memory. So we're going to take this map that we already got um, and this map is big. Um, in, this, in this picture, um, we only see a little circle around a, a small part of it. That's all that Kud is showing. Um, but really, um, it's much bigger. Um, and it, there's density, not just where this molecule is, but for the whole um, many chains here. So I guess it's not that easy for me to make it really big. Um, but, you can see this density all over the place here, right? So this is a big molecule and we're just sort of getting, having a little window in it is all we're looking at here. Okay, so we're just gonna cut out the part of this map that's around this chain and then we're gonna build this chain. So let's see how to do that in, in Phoenix. So we can um, close our density modification window there. And um, once again, under cryoEM, I'm um, just going to scroll down. There should be a map box. There we go. Map box near the bottom. If I just click on that once, it'll open up a window for me. And um, once again, we want a job title. And um, I can just take it right here. We're going to box the density modified map around the supplied model. Okay, I'll paste that in. So that's, that's what we're going to do. Um, so the map file is the one we just looked at. That's our density modified map. It's in resolve cryoem one denmob map.ccp4. Here's our map. And we're going to put in um, a model. And the model is, is the model that was supplied here. So it, in a real case, <clears throat> we don't have this yet. But just for doing this, we can use the model that was supplied. And that's in our main directory here. And it was called April ferritin BDB. It's the same model we're looking at in Coot there. Okay, and um, so what are we doing? It says map mod file, model file, and um, output name prefix. Um, we can call it anything we want, but let's just, so we can type something in here. If we type in denmod map box, then our output files are going to be called denmod mod mapbox.pdb, and that's going to contain the same model. And then it's the other output file is denmod mapbox.ccp4, which is this, this map boxed around the model. And we're going to check mask atoms. So that means um, we're going to zero the map out everywhere that's away from the atoms. And in this case, we can specify the radius, three angstroms. And um, this is a little bit tight. This is just to make this um, easy. Um, other options for map box. So if you'd want to be totally safe, you don't mask around the atoms because um, maybe you would mask away something that's good if you do this. So if you want to be safe, you don't mask around the atoms. And um, other things you can do, um, you can select the region. So you have to, it has to figure out um, how big the box is. And the default is to take the model, if you supplied one, and then add um, 
box cushion all around the model and box that big. If you don't have a model, you can say density select and then it'll box around the density. And if you wanna just get the unique part of the map, you can say extract unique. So then if the map has symmetry, it only gives you the symmetry unique part of the map. And there's a couple other things you can do at the bottom here. Um, you can keep the origin of the map. That means if you take the resulting box map, it will superimpose upon the original map if you display it in Coot or you display it in Chimera. Um, you can also, if you wish, you can not keep the origin and it will shift the new map to put the origin at zero, zero, zero. So usually you don't do that. You leave it just the way it is normally. So all we did, just a couple of things, we put in the map, put in the model, gave it a name for the output, and we said mask atoms. And then we hit run, this just takes one second. Um, some things on my screen are in the way. Let's see, I have to move this out of the way. There we go, run. So then um, now we've created a boxed version um, of our map that's much smaller. And so I had to read the model, read the map, boxing with the radius of three angstroms, all done. Okay, so now this thing, <clears throat> we could open this one in Coot also if we want to. Let's just do it just so we can see it. So file, open map. And um, that's not in this directory, it's a directory up. Oh, it's in map box. That's where it, so map box writes to the map box subdirectory. So map box, and there's our denmod map box.ccp4. We can open it and it should be a little quicker. There, there it is. And um, you'll notice that now it doesn't, it's not as big as the original map. It just, it's just around our model, molecule. And we're gonna adjust the contours on this one in the usual way. By put in 50 here, one there, RMSD apply, okay. Now we can turn off the other maps and um, there's our, that one doesn't, can't see it, can you? We're gonna change our properties to make our color visible. There we go, okay, okay. Okay, so here's our map. And now it's been boxed so that um, it's easier to work with. And I can move it around if I want to more easily. And, um, it only contains the region that's of interest. We can, if you wanna just see what we've got, we can do our cell and symmetry, show unit cells. And um, this is the original box, the big box. And you can see we're only looking at a little teeny piece of that. Okay, so now we have a little box. Um, and once again, code is just showing us everything within a sphere of a certain radius. If we wanted to change that, we could go map parameters and map radius, make that 35, and then the, what's displayed will be bigger. So we can see everything that we were looking for before. Okay, so that, there's our map that we already saw. And just what we saw before. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to set my properties properly. Yep. Okay. There we go. There we go. There's our map. All right. Looks fine. Okay. So now the goal is let's um, let's redo this model building. So we're going to forget that we had a model, and now we just have a map. Looks like this. So, oh, you know, this is a nice map, right? So it's not gonna be as hard as might be. Um, so that's our map and let's build a model into this map and let's assign the sequence and put all the side chains in the right place. That's the goal. So how can we do that? Um, so we got the tool for that. So now we're gonna go um, map to model. And once again, we're gonna type in the right things here. So our title is quick build using density modified map. Pop it in there. 
And what do we need? We need a map file resolution. So map file. It's the boxed map that we just made. So put in the one from Mapbox, not the original. If we take our density modified map, we could put in denmod map.cc before. But that's big. That has 24 copies. It's like kind of a waste of time to build the whole thing. Um, so instead of that, we're going to use the one from Mapbox that we cut down to the right size. OK, that's in there. And high resolution, 1.8. And we need a sequence file. And now the sequence file is the unique part. It's just one chain here. So browse to the sequence file. Um, it's up here a little bit. And seek unique dot dot. Open. OK. What do you need? Number of processors. Um, so we're here. Four. Once again, doesn't use them all, all the time, unfortunately. Um, and then another thing that you do need, it'll just tell you if you don't do this, but you need to tell it if the map is the asymmetric part of the map or the whole thing. So if we had put in the whole map, you would check, uncheck asymmetric map, meaning it's not asymmetric, it is symmetric. And then you would find symmetry. Um, and then you might build unique part only. In this case, we only have just one chain. So asymmetric map, yes. And the rest gets taken care of. And I think that's all we need. Then we're going to hit run. And then it's going to run. And um, you could auto sharpen the map, but normally you have already done this. So, and we have already um, definitely modified it, which is better. So we're all done with all that kind of thing. And we're going to do one build cycle. It's all good. We hit run, run now. So now it's going to try to build a model. And um, in Phoenix, there's uh, lots of different tools for building models. And um, so we're just going to talk about one here, this map to model. Another tool um, is the path walking tool that um, that Baker's group developed, and that's also available. And there's also tools for finding helices and strands, stuff like that. So many different options. This is the one that you can use if you don't, you just want it to run and give you something. Um, this is a convenient one to, to use. And you can use this for very big things if you want. You can use it to build a ribosome that takes a long time, or a lot of processors or a big machine. Um, but you can, it can do uh, many different possibilities. Okay, so let's talk about how this one works. And that's going to be in our other slides. Or actually, any questions so far here? You can just stop me if, you, if there are. So let's talk um, for a couple of minutes about one procedure for uh, building models in cryo-EM maps. Like I said, there's lots of different ways you can do this. So we're gonna um, do uh, model building and also later we'll talk about docking. Um, so the idea here um, is um, we're gonna start with the map that maybe like the picture we've got here and try to build a model that's reasonable. And um, the basic procedure is um, first to try to isolate one chain's worth of density. So to try to take the map and then segment it, um, try to figure out where one chain belongs to yield something like what's on the right here. Um, and then within that one chain, region of one chain, um, try to identify where C alpha and C beta positions are based on the fact that they uh, the C beta stick out of the chain a little bit and um, then construct and refine an all atom model based on result there. And going through these steps requires that the resolution be about four inches or better so that you can see a little bit about side chains at least. And so, how do we do these different steps? Um, so, in the map to model procedure, um, we basically try to trace the chain um, the way a person does that if you're if you're building a model by hand with Coot um, or O or some similar uh, kind of pro program. Um, 
first you kind of look for helices and strands. So we're talking about protein here at the moment. Um, so you find the secondary structure and that's often obvious in a, in a map. And so you can build a good part of a structure in, in pieces um, just by plunking helices or strands in the right place. And it's very, as I said, it's very often obvious where those go. Um, and then the second part that's a little trickier um, is to try to find the connections. So the, and this, this trick is done very much like a person does when they're building in Coot, like I said. So this is um, part of a real map um, where there's a, helis, a couple of helices. And then we're gonna dial, adjust the contour level until um, the contours between one secondary structure element and another secondary structure element just connect. So as, as you dial down the, the contours, at some point, they'll just touch. And um, typically, the main chain is higher density than the side chains, so that this procedure works pretty well. And so now we found the connectivity between these two secondary structure elements. And if it's ambiguous, then um, that has to be resolved at a later stage. So you might try different possibilities. And then you iterate this whole procedure. Um, so now we've connected these three things, these two things with a chain. And then by adjusting the contour levels again and again, it can build up the whole chain. And works actually better than you might imagine. Works very well. And then once you've built up, Excuse me, Tom. Yep. Um, yeah. There is a question. How do you provide a symmetry file? Where, what is that symmetry file? Yeah, it, you can supply a symmetry file um, that represents the symmetry that was used in the reconstruction of the map. You can supply that if you wish. Um, normally, let's suppose, so this particular molecule, um, apoferritin, has high symmetry. If you wanted to, you could supply the whole map. So now you have 24 copies of the same thing. And then you could supply um, a symmetry file that specifies the rotation translation matrices relating those 24 copies. Um, and that would tell the software, build only one of these guys. Um, and here's how you um, identify what the unique part is. And that and symmetry file is written to disk when they press the checking symmetry button? Um, that symmetry file is, um, yeah, it is. Um, and also another way to get that file. So normally you're not gonna write this file yourself. You're gonna get that file um, by running uh, Phoenix map symmetry. So you put in the map and just say, find the symmetry. And then it will write that file for you. So that's how you would get it. Or um, in map to model, you can just skip the whole thing um, and just tell it that it's symmetric um, and it will figure out the symmetry and write it out and you don't have to put in any file at all. So the file just allows you to specify that if you want to specify it in a certain way, but you don't normally need to do that. That seems to answer the question. Thank you. Okay. So, so we've built up Suppose we've built up a, um, a tracing through the density um, that has basically connected density um, that shows one part of the, model, of the chain. Um, and then we're gonna trace the chain path through the highest parts of that density. And then um, as in this example, if, if you just sort of walk through here, you can see where the side chains are. There's a bump right there. There's another bump right there. So I just put blue dots indicating where bumps are located. Um, and those are indicating approximately where the C beta positions ought to be. Um, and if you know where the C betas are, then you know where the C alphas are. And um, you also know the distances between all the C alphas. It's 3.8 angstrom. So then you can kind of optimize the relationship between all those things. So C alphas go this distance apart and they go next to C betas if you can. And um, there's a tool that somebody else wrote um, a while back uh, from Skolnick's lab that will take this C alpha trace and make an all atom model out of it. It's pretty good. Um, 
not always perfect, but then you can just refine this um, and then that will optimize all the geometry. And so this works pretty well. Here's a couple of examples. Um, so this map is you know, um, not bad, um, not the greatest map. So four angstrom map, you can see kind of how it works. Um, this is what's built. Um, and if you look in detail, you'll see that some things are some things are built well, like this part of the helix is good, but not everything is at this resolution at four angstroms. So four angstroms, you get a lot that's right, um, and you get significant um, mistakes as well. Um, at higher resolution, um, you get more built. So this higher resolution map looks pretty good. Um, and looking at details of that, you can see where the side chains are, and it would tend to build them into the side chains. Uh, more or less properly. So the higher the resolution, the better the map, you're gonna, the model that you're going to get is the bottom line. And um, so beyond four angstroms, this will build you something and it'll have some things that are right and some things that are that are not so good. Um, one more thing, at the, at the end of model building, um, you have to identify what side chains go where. And so here's the procedure for figuring out which side chains, how the sequence of the molecule that you supply is aligned to the main chain, um, thereby telling you where the side chains are. Okay, so here's um, how we do that. Um, so here's some pretty nice density, right? And let's just look at this residue right here. So that's a big side chain, and you could guess what you think it might be, um, but we can do that a little bit automatically by putting every possible side chain there and asking how well or correlated the side chain expected density is with what's there. And um, so here's a little chart that shows the result of doing that. So if you put a glycine there, it's not very correlated. If you put an alanine, it's not very good. But if you put a leucine, it's better. Methionine is better. But if you put a phenylalanine or tyrosine, it fits really well, right? And so you get a, a whole list of possibilities and relative probabilities for each one of those, where in this case, phenylalanine and tyrosine are the most probable and the other ones are you know, somewhat possible. So we can do that at every position. And even if they're not quite as clear as what we're seeing here, we can then ask, how can we align the sequence so as to maximize the likelihood of this whole thing? So here's the result of putting the sequence in in four different positions. So if we put it in that's offset by three residues from where it's supposed to be and score all the residues, um, score is not very good. And minus two, not very good. Minus one, it's a little bit better. Um, but if you put in the right place, suddenly the score is really great because all the side chains fit. So if you have decent density like this, this works great. Even if it's fairly poor, um, works reasonably well. So this is a way to assign the sequence in, at the end of the whole procedure. We'll skip these guys. Not that interesting at the moment. Okay. So here's our sort of summary of the things that we've been doing with this with this chain with this um, map. We had two half maps for our um, apoferritin structure. We created one densely modified map, and now we're building a model into it. And let's just see how that model is doing. Let's go over to there. And it's telling us that it displayed the initial trace and it's building a model for each fragment, of which is actually just one fragment here. And we can go to our coot window and see if it's showing us anything of interest. So we'll turn off that map and, okay. So this is what it did. So first off, um, it, come back, okay. So this is the, the map that we start off with. Um, and it identified how to trace through it in the way I was showing you. And this is the, a, ribbon diagram kind of of the tracing through that density. So it doesn't look like perfect or anything, 
um, but it, in fact, it has pretty much the right tracing. And this, it also shows us a little map um, that just has the density around the tracing. And we can just go through it and see that it pretty much traces in the right way. And this map, you know, it's a pretty good map. So it makes it relatively easy. Oh, just to mention, so we can see in the distance there, there's other copies of this. And that's because um, Coot doesn't know um, the fact that we've actually just boxed around this one little region. So Coot is displaying a symmetry related molecule over here. Uh, we're not actually interested in that. So we're not gonna, we're just gonna ignore that. Okay, so it makes a pretty nice trace, um, goes pretty much the whole way. And you can see this part looks like um, extended structure. Most of this is helical, traces through the loops pretty well. Okay, so everything looks pretty good. And um, so it's put in uh, 160 residues, 162 residues. And now the procedure it's going through is it's trying to optimize the geometry and all these things. So it looks at this region here and it compares it. It, it runs the tool um, find helices strands as well. And it finds out that helices are placed along these helices. And then it tries to say, how can I seamlessly go from the chain that I've got here to a helix that I know is there um, and going on to the next part, et cetera. So that, that procedure is going through right now. And also the other thing it doesn't know at this point is what's the direction of the chain. So um, it didn't necessarily know if it goes this way or that way. Of course, there's good ways to determine that. Um, for example, um, if you look at a, let's just look at this one, we can probably figure it out. Oh, that's the wrong, not the good map. We want to look at the, the original map. There we go. Um, so if we look at this map, um, in a, the side chains on a helix point backwards towards the end terminus. So that's not that way. It's the other way around. So if I turn it the other way. Here, our side chains point down and backwards. And that is a great way to figure out what the direction of the helix is. And another way to do the same thing is to build a model in both directions and then score the fit to density in the two directions. And so we've built the model both ways um, and refine it both ways um, and, and assign the sequence both ways and then score um, based on fit to density um, and geometry and uh, I think that's all. And um, for each one of the, and length of, of the chain and um, then score whichever one is the better one and choose that as the direction. Okay. And we're doing adding the side chains. So it's getting close to being done and not quite finished there. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation in a sec. Any, do we have any questions right here? No questions in the chat. Okay. Anybody have any at the, while we're waiting for that? Okay, we'll let that go. And um, let's talk about the next thing for model building while that's finishing. Let's see, we're doing, yeah. So we're scoring, we're refining the new model, adding side chains. Yeah, so we're just about done. Okay. And, okay, so we mentioned before about um, finding maps symmetry. So here's the tool that does that. Um, you supply a map and in the process of creating a map, normally um, the software or you um, specify that the map have, has a certain kind of internal symmetry that's enforced typically in, the, in your, um, reconstruction procedure. So in the lower left uh, panel here, 
um, this beta galactosidase um, was the map was created using D2 symmetry. So that means that the map has perfect D2 symmetry because that was enforced in the procedure. And the one on top, this map was created with um, C7 or sevenfold of symmetry. So once again, it's perfect symmetry. Um, and therefore, there's no point in doing anything um, with multiple regions that are exactly the same. You're just wasting time. So it's good to find the symmetry and then do all your work on the unique part of the map. So here's how that, the, the automatic procedure works. Um, first, it just tests um, typical point group symmetries like C, D, um, I, O, T. All, these are the, the common uh, point groups that you find. And um, it just tests them all um, by putting random points in the map, applying the symmetry, asking whether the symmetry yields the same thing over again in a different orientation, um, and then scoring it based on that. And it makes the assumption that the um, principal rotation axes are along the, or, uh, the main directions of the map. It also makes the assumption that the center of the symmetry is the center of the map or else a corner of the map. And if those things are not true, then you have to use some other procedure um, to generate what the, the symmetry is. And so, for example, here's, like I said, beta galactosidase. Um, and this procedure can then be used to extract just the asymmetric part of the map. So the trick here um, is we're going to assume we're going to identify the symmetry, in this case, C2. Um, and then we're going to try to find a part of the map, which if you apply the symmetry, it would generate the whole map. And we're trying to generate and identify a part of the map that's compact as possible so that we get something that often looks like the subunit. In this case, we get exactly one subunit. So the, the trick is this, we contour the map at a medium level that yields regions about 50 residues in size. And then we group all the symmetry related regions and we choose one member of the group optimizing the compactness and the connectivity of the unique part of the map. And that yields us this red region. So totally automatic. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to put anything in there at all. You just put in this map, ask for the asymmetric part, gives you the red part. And it's not perfect if the map has, um, if your molecules are very elongated, it won't necessarily get you the elongated version. It might get some part where one end is stuck on the other end. If it's very high resolution so that you can trace between all, the whole length of the molecule with clear density, then it will make the whole thing. It will make a long elongated molecule. If it's poor resolution, then it will put it into a, a more compact version. Another way to get a model is to just dock a model into the map. And um, so we have a simple procedure for that. And actually um, more procedures are coming along um, from the phaser team. Um, as well to do this kind of thing. So here's an example that if we have time at the end, we'll do. Um, so we have, here's a map uh, um, which has um, many copies um, of, of a chain. And, uh, and we have an example of the, uh, of the unique part that in this case comes from crystallography, um, but it could come from, from anyway. So the, the goal is to dock this into that density. And our procedure is um, first try uh, simple things, just try a pure translation, either at low resolution or high resolution, and see if the only difference between this mo molecule, the search molecule and the map is just, it just, just needs to be translated to put in the right place. And that's often the case. If suppose somebody might give you a map and a model and the origins are just different. So you can use this pure translation to just put one on top of the other. Um, if that doesn't work, 
um, try a rotation in translation. And in either case, um, we score it based on um, rigid body refinement after docking. So we dock um, to optimize local correlations. And then we do a rigid body refinement um, on each part of this molecule and then get the map model correlation and score it that way. And you can search for multiple chains. So you can search for A, then B, then C. You can search for just density. So you can supply, you can apply a map and ask how this map fits into this other map. You can apply symmetry and you, it uses multiprocessing. So in this particular case, here's this chain docked into there, um, fits nicely. Okay, and that, I want to just remember to do this to thank the whole Phoenix project for all these tools that um, allow us to do all these things. Okay, so now let's see where we are in our uh, model building. Just about finished here. We're doing um, uh, still working on some of these segments. Yeah, so again, much. A little slow due to using all that my CPU on Zoom. In any case, it's uh, getting close there. I don't think it's shown us anything more since we had. Okay, any um, any additional discussion or questions on these things since we're still waiting for this one to finish? Anybody got any questions going? Yeah, put up a hand if you've got a question. That was a good time. And uh, Phoenix people are welcome to make comments about things too, actually. Things that people ought to know that I didn't mention. You want to, uh, I don't know if you brought this up earlier on. To, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn my video on, sorry. But uh, did you make a comment at all about boxing maps before doing density modification? Yeah. Whether um, that's appropriate or? Yeah, so back on the density modification, um, if lots of times with in cryoam, you, you start off with a very big map and a very small model in the middle of it. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, you would just put that whole big map in and do density modification and everything would be fine. Um, but we're actually making some assumptions in our density modification procedure um, that aren't completely um, uh, true for a, a, a normal cryo-EM map. And the key assumption there is that the density, the errors in the solvent region are uniform um, throughout the entire map. Now, if you think of a cryo-EM map, the way they work is um, a starting map after reconstruction. Basically at the very edges of the map, um, it's pretty flat, maybe even zeroed out. And um, the errors are very small. Um, as you get close to the molecule, um, the errors are much bigger. Um, and in the middle of the molecule, the errors are also big. So basically, if you plotted errors as a function of position in the map, they're small near the edges. Um, and then more or less uniform near the molecule. And then as you go to the far edge, then they're small again. So our assumption in density modification is that these numbers are pretty constant. So the procedure that we use um, is to box the map in a region that's a bit bigger than the molecule, but not as big as the original map. So that basically within the box region, the density, the errors in density are kind of constant. And so that's done by default for you um, by choosing a, a box that's um, five or 10 angstroms in each dimension, in each uh, bigger than the molecule all around all the edges. So you can supply either the full map and it will try to box the map that way, or else you can supply um, a box map where you have boxed it um, five or 10 angstroms around the molecule and that will work um, just fine too. So either of those, but you do need to be aware that 
you want to do one of the or the other of those things. Yeah. What about boxing out just an asymmetric unit? Yeah, that's a different story. Um, so you might think that you could just box an asymmetric unit of your map and do density modification on that. And that one, generally speaking, does not work. And the reason it does not work is because your asymmetric unit um, is the edges of the asymmetric unit are going to be other molecules. So if you box around the asymmetric unit, you're cutting right in the middle of a molecule. And that means the edges of your boxed map um, have big values. And they're not random values. They're actually density from your map. And so an, 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 an assumption in the density modification procedure is that either the map is um, periodic, in, as in crystallography, or else the map has very low value, or only random errors at the edges. So one of those two things needs to be true. And if you bump it on your asymmetric unit, um, there isn't any way to do that. So, um, and of course, I did try doing this, and it doesn't work as you, it's not supposed to, and it doesn't. Okay. So if you're going to, don't box out a, a particle, uh, one monomer out of a, of a complex then, but you can box the whole thing down to a smaller box, maybe if you leave enough buffer. Yeah. And you know, this, there's one situation where you, you have no choice about this. That is if you have a helical array, um, at some point um, it's, the, the rays almost is, you know, from practical purposes, kind of infinite, um, but you, you only get a piece of that. So you're going to have some edge effects there. But actually, in practice, it works pretty well anyways. You can do it on helical rays. And so in one direction, you're going to cut it off. And maybe it's not optimal, but it's, it often still works pretty well. That's actually a nice segue into a question in the chat here about, is helical symmetry automatically handled in map to model? And in those cases, can we benefit from map averaging? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, in fact, um, to answer the second part first, normally in for helical samples, um, the helical symmetry has already been averaged in the map that you get at this stage. So um, no, generally speaking, you cannot benefit from map averaging with helical symmetry because um, the map has already been averaged. That's usually true. And um, if it hasn't, then you're, you're probably better off to do that averaging in the pro data processing step than, than doing it in the density modification step. However, I, uh, you can um, uh, apply uh, symmetry in the density modification procedure if you wish. And um, I, if so one real example was a user sent me some a map which they said was asymmetric. And um, density modification worked pretty well, but not great. It turned out that the map actually did have symmetry, but they did not use it in their data processing procedure. Hmm. Um, then you can find that symmetry um, with find, uh, not with the map symmetry tool, but with um, a find NCFs from density, which is for crystallography. So you can find that symmetry, get the same matrices and apply, and you can use that, that, that symmetry in the density modification procedure, just like in crystallography. Um, and that actually made a much better map. So, so you can do that. Now, whether if they had done it fully, using that um, symmetry in the data processing, that might have ended up being better um, than, than um, this procedure I just described. Um, and, in, and in my test cases, generally speaking, doing the, dense, the averaging first in the data processing and then doing density modification on the average map seems best, but you could do it the other way around. Yeah, actually, I, I missed part of that question. What was the other half of the question? Uh, the first part was, uh, is the helical symmetry automatically handled in map to model? Oh, um, 
you have to, it's automatically handled if you check yes um, under helical symmetry. Um, there was a box there. Let me find it. My, you know. So um, another little trick in um, the GUI, you can, you're, I'm running a job here. I can go back to configure and see what parameters I put in. Um, and if I wanted to, I could change one and then run another um, job um, that's very similar. I see that I missed something actually. So was, uh, it's just why it's taking longer. So. I was supposed to make the thoroughness quick, but I did it medium. Uh -huh. So it's actually taking twice as long as normal. So that's why we didn't get an answer yet. Um, so we may not finish. So I'm glad I noticed that. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, back to our symmetry. So if we um, specify here um, that the symmetry is helical, like that, um, then it would deal with it automatically. So we, we would so we'd go helical like that. Um, and then we'd say, no, it's not an asymmetric map. And then yes, unique part only um, and um, find symmetry. Then it would do all the things that you want. So then it would find this helical symmetry. It would build the asymmetric part of the helix. Um, it would, um, then it would generate a helical array that has, I don't know, five or 10 copies, something like that. Um, so it'd make, it'd make enough copies to make um, more than a one turn of the helix. Um, and then it would refine that whole thing for you and supply you back with the whole um, part of your helical array. So it would look kind of like what you, I think what you would expect to see there. Okay, so now that I know that this is going to take longer we're not going to finish it but we can see what it already did actually because it's written out intermediate files so we're just going to look at that and just see the answer so in code um, we should be able to find if we open coordinates and we find our um, map to model okay so there's map to model um, and the naming in these subdirectories so, so it did map box two means that was the second thing that we did. Map to model three, that's the third thing we did. Resolve core OEM one, that's the first thing we did. So anyways, map to model. And in map to model, there's some maps, not interested in map to model. And um, there's a subdirectory of tracing. That's what we wanted to do, trace and build. And there, um, so one, the, this, Tracing that we saw there is um, was our path.pdb. We already saw that. And let's see. And this coot run.scheme is actually a little file that will take the model, it's the, the, the chains that have been built and display them for you. And these guys. You know, maybe I don't have any final things to show. That's a little bit surprising. Okay, so we're not gonna finish because it's taking too long. Yeah, it's gonna, I, those of you who are running it probably already finished, um, but we're not gonna see the result on this one because I didn't quite set it up right. Let's see if or anything anywhere. I don't think so. Oh, actually, I'll just show you the one that I did. So, yeah, that's easiest. I ran this before, of course. And we can just look at what I did that time. Let's This is April 13. 
see where it is. April 13, Denmark, Mel, Building 6. Okay, let's find that quickly. April 13, 6, there we go. That's that, and then we can go to our map to model, which, Oh, that's the current one. Oops, sorry about that. That wasn't the one before. Five. There we go. Map to model. There we go. Map to model at PV. Okay, finally, find the file that we should be getting. Open that. Okay, so now we can back off. Look at our model. And get rid of the path tracing. And it looks pretty nice. And we can compare this. This is what part I like about this one. We can compare this model with the model that we got by just put, taking a crystal structure of apoferritin, real space refining it against this map. And what you see is these two models are almost identical. So we just recreated. Um, so we didn't build multiple confirmations, of course, right? So here's that phenylalanine that had multiple confirmations. Um, and we just built one of them. Um, but the rest of this the chain here is like almost exactly the same, which is amazing in several ways. So that means that the model building worked well, it builds exactly the same thing as we got from a crystal structure. Um, the other thing is that the crystal structure is identical to the cryo-REM structure, you know, with tiny changes from real space refinement. Um, but basically these things superimpose almost exactly. So we missed a little bit here, um, that would require a little bit of um, rebuilding. Um, but for the most part, it's spot on. So this is high resolution, right? So this is better than two angstroms. That's what you expect at high resolution. At lower resolution, it won't build um, as accurately because it doesn't have nearly as much um, information, of course. Okay, do we get any more questions on model building or do a docking to finish up? Uh, there's a question here, Tom, about uh, experiences in tracing nucleic acids, particularly RNA. Yeah. So, um, mapped model will will trace RNA as well, RNA, DNA, protein, or any combination. Um, but it's it's much better for protein. It's it's easier to trace protein is the bottom line than it is to trace uh, RNA. Um, so, if you have a decent map. Um, the RNA will be the the heal, the B form part, the A form parts of the RNA or B form parts of DNA will be built nicely. The parts that are loops will they'll try to build them, um, but they won't necessarily be that accurate. And depending on the resolution, so so the good part is you can do this at low resolution, like at four angstroms works almost as well as at three. Um, but um, the parts that are um, not regular or not built that well. It's just really hard to do that. So, but it, any size can be built. So, like I said before, you can put in a ribosome uh, map um, and give it, you know, 100 processors and give it a couple of days and then it will build everything. And it'll build, if you have a good map, 
for a ribosome, let's say it will build maybe 60 or 70%, something like that. And um, if you have a bad map, it won't build much correctly at all. But so if you have enough, enough processing, you can just use it with RNA, yes. Okay, so, so another, let's, yeah. Another oh, question no, no, no. actually about how to differentiate between a good fit and an overfit. Any parameters and scores that suggest fitting score? Um, it's a good question um, of overfitting. Uh, in practice, in this kind of automatic model building, um, you don't get that much overfitting. And the reason you don't is because it tends to be conservative in what it builds. So um, it tends to put things generally only where the density is pretty good. So it tends to miss things sometimes more often than it um, overfits. Um, so it is something to be a, pay attention to and be aware of. Um, you could interpret some of the things as overfitting. Just for example, this little region over here that where it's clearly is built differently than before. Um, and we can just look, turn on our density and see. Um, and presumably, yeah, it did something. I'm assuming that's the, yeah, that's the original one is the good one. And it got built wrong. Okay, so this particular spot right there, um, that's overfit. It's not built correctly. Um, and the reason it's not built correctly is there's some there's a register error here, I think. Um, and so it needs another residue put in. And so that's a second step. And actually, the way we get solve this kind of problem um, is find all the worst fitting residues in the structure. And this one will come up as a very bad fitting residue because it's out of the density. Um, so the correlation between model density um, and the density in the map right here will show up as like a big flat. So actually, Coot will do that for us too, right? So you can, um, uh, yeah. Oh, for it. Um, we can in Coot you can identify all the all the poor fit, fitting residues, and this would come right up. Um, so then what you do is you cut it at all the poor fitting residues, um, and then rebuild between the remaining parts, and then it would rebuild through the density. And then you would find out that you need to add a residue, um, and then change the sequence, you know, at the at the end there. So that's um, basically um, the kind of problem you end up with. Um, but in terms of overfitting, another way to think about over uh, cases that would really be real overfitting would be you're building, like if you put in a lot of water molecules or something like that um, to try to fit the density. And in crystallography, that's a big problem because you use the model to improve the map all the time. In cryo-EM, generally speaking, the map is more or less fixed. Um, so we're not using the model to improve the map and therefore mistakes in the model don't get propagated into the map. Um, so it, in general, overfitting is not nearly such a problem. That's not entirely true because you could use the model, go all the way back to the beginning um, and improve your um, procedure for uh, reconstruction that would allow, uh, um, be can conceive would be a be a problem for um, overfitting. Also, if you use the model in density modification, it could result in overfitting. As I said, it doesn't seem to, but it could. Even if you use the model in sharpening, that could also yield some kind of overfitting. None of these things seem to be big problems in practice, um, but it's good to ask the question. It's good to be aware it's a possibility um, that that could happen. Right. A uh, couple of other questions. Uh, do you see alternate confirmations in high resolution cryo EM maps? Yeah, um, I haven't looked for them. So um, I think others have done so, but I haven't looked for them. And so I don't know um, to what extent we'd see them. In, in this map, this particular one at 1.8 angstroms, um, I don't. I don't see them. I mean, they're not, they're not obvious. How about that? 
No, I think that's a great question. I don't know that anybody's looked at that in detail yet because there aren't that many maps, but it, it's going to be very interesting to see what we see, I think. Yeah. Uh, whether the, I mean, I can't imagine the reconstruction process is going to be working down to the level of alternate confirmations, but uh, yeah, it is very interesting to see given that the number of particles we average over is a lot fewer than the number of particles in a crystal. Typically, that's true. Um, so, and another question is: uh, Will I guess map to model attempt to build polyalanine at mysterious densities? So, I guess when you can't see what it is, what you get out. Yes. So, um, so map to model actually initially traces alanine polyaliglai um, everywhere. So it, at the beginning, it doesn't put any side chains in at all. It just tries to trace through the, the main chain. And then as a second step, it tries to put on side chains. So sort of by default, if there's, so if your map is a little bit low resolution, like four, um, often you don't really even see side chains basically at all, except for a couple of big ones. Um, and then, it will tend to just build alanine, like you say, or maybe some glycines um, through the whole thing. Um, this actually by default, where, where it cannot figure out what the sequence really is, um, it puts in the best side chains at each position that it can. So, and you can turn that on or off, but that's the default is, so if it, if it couldn't figure out how to align the sequence you supplied with this particular region, it might still put in an isoleucine here because that's what it looks like. Great. Thanks, Tom. That's the questions that we have at the minute. Okay. Let's do one more thing then. Um, and let's um, do a docking. Let's just see. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now it's going to go forever. Let me just make sure I have um, processing power to do something here. So go on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We can try anyways. All right. So let's do one more tutorial. So what we're going to do is we're going to dock model into the map, and it shouldn't take us very long. Um, so we need a new project and set up tutorial data, select a data set, and where's docking? Let's see. We're going to do grow EL, cryo EM map 8750 and chain A of one SS8. That's the one I showed you in the pictures. So this is docking a model into map with doc model and map. OK, ready and OK. And last modified is Groyal doc refine. And we can get the info from settings like usual, get the readme. There it is. Okay. Tells us what we are going to do. So this tutorial data is good for uh, map symmetry and fitting a model into the map and real space refinement. We're not going to do the last one. You're going to learn about that next week. But let's do the map symmetry part. And we already set up our tutorial data. And let's um, find the map symmetry. So this is going to be pretty easy. Oops, cancel. OK, so once again, we're in the Krauyam space here and we're going to look for map symmetry which is down here ways map symmetry and let's put in our title which i'm gonna paste again find symmetry find symmetry and we're going to put in a map file and emd 8750.map that should be it okay so we're just gonna hit run to make it work but just to let you know there's other a few other options. If you, if you want to restrict 
the possibilities of what symmetries to consider. Um, instead of saying any here, you could say C2 or D7 or whatever you think it is. Um, and if you want to include helical symmetry, you need to check mark here. And the reason it's not checked by default is because most maps aren't helical symmetry. If it is helical symmetry, you definitely know it. Um, and it takes a little bit longer that way. So it's just off because it's real quick for all the other possibilities. And you don't have to put in the resolution if you don't want to. And um, if you want to um, get the map, the correlation of symmetry related parts of the map, after by and specify the symmetry file that says exactly what to look for, you can put that in. So normally you don't do any of that. You just put in the map file, um, you leave it at any, you hit run, and then it should find the symmetry pretty fast. Um, except for my computer is really slow, but aside <laughs> from that, it's okay. So the slow part is reading the map. And estimates the resolution of the map. Actually, this is this is just us estimating the resolution from the um, from the gridding. So it's not really doing anything sophisticated in this particular one. It's checking fifty different pot types of symmetry. And for each one of those, it's like I said, generating random points, identifying the density at each point applying the symmetry, seeing if the density is correlated in the symmetry related ones. And then um, after it does that quickly for all 50, it takes the top five and rescores them. Um, and then it should give us the symmetry of this particular map in a moment. And it's gonna score them by correlation of density. Okay, so um, this says, the CC of 0.92 says, that um, if you take any point in the map and then you rotate it with sevenfold or 14 fold symmetry and you compare the density of all those other 13 places to this one, the correlation of those is 0.9. And you might, might ask, I didn't mean to do, oh, this says that map to model is doing something. Yeah. Um, you might ask why this is a perfect map, right? I mean this map used D7 symmetry to reconstruct the map. So why isn't the correlation of symmetry related regions one instead of 0.9? And the reason is because D7 symmetry does not fit in a square map. So the lattice of the map is just a square grid. And um, so if you take a point that's on a grid point and then you rotate it seven, you know, one seventh, it's no longer on a grid point. So it's between grid points then you interpolate between grid points, and then that is not going to give you the exact same value as on that grid point. So that's the main reason why these numbers are not one. And um, also the symmetry here, um, I have a little notation of D7A, B, and so forth. Those are not anything sophisticated. That's just telling us if the um, sevenfold if the twofold is along X or along Y, it's going to be one of those two possibilities normally. And it's the same for icosahedral symmetry. There's different orientations. You could take the same thing, um, and they're not different in any sophistic in any um, formal way. That we just differentiate them with letters A, B, C. Okay. Um, so this little file, symmetry from map to NCS spec, that's the file that you were asking for um, earlier, um, which you don't need to use normally because it's all done internally. Um, but you can look at this, this file if you want, and it shows all the matrices that, that were found. Yeah. Okay, so there's our, there's our map symmetry. And now let's, um, it's gonna tell us what we're supposed to do. Um, next thing is we're gonna um, find, uh, we're gonna dock SS8, one SS8, um, into the EMD 8750. So 1SS8 is um, uh, x-ray structure. It's one of Paul's actually. And it's, um, and it's, it's also of uh, Royale. 
but it's a crystal structure and one subunit. And we're going to dock that into the cryo-EM map. So let's do that. I'm going to do find chain A, and that's going to be under dock in map. So let's go to dock in map. And the same thing as usual tells us what we need, map file, resolution, search model. And then um, if you want, you can supply a fixed model. And the fixed model is basically blocking some part of the map. It's like what you've already fit. Um, and you can give it a sequence file if you want, or a symmetry file to tell it, um, put this chain in all these symmetry related places if you want that. So anyways, we're not gonna do those things. We're just gonna find chain A and we need a map. Let's get a map. Uh, EMD 8750.map. Okay, there's a map. We need a search model, the thing that we're gonna put in. That's our chain A. And I think that's everything we need. Let's see if we need, oh, it said resolution of four processors, four. Okay, so let's go down. Resolution four processors, four. I'm gonna overuse my computer. Let's see what happens. Okay, and then run, that's all we need to do. <clears throat> so the procedure here is it's gonna try to find, see if it can just slide this along and just um, translate it to put it right in place. Um, and if that works, then, then we're done. Otherwise it's gonna have to rotate it and find out where it goes. Now, the procedure for finding the chain is actually a little bit trickier than you might imagine. You might think we just take the whole molecule and then rotate it and then put that in every different possible place in the map um, and get the correlation and then score all those um, and then um, find the best one. And yes, you can do that. Um, but the thing is, if you have a big molecule, um, rotating it and then translating that thing, that takes a lot of time. And so actually we don't do it that way. Instead, we cut the molecule up into little pieces and then we find the rotations and translations for the little pieces, which is much quicker. Um, and then we find an arrangement of all those little translated pieces where they all have the same relationship to each other they had in the beginning. And that's the answer. So that's how it's actually done. Then we find a, a place where that works. And um, then you get in this, you know, let me print the log file out here so you can look at it. So, our log files will say something like, um, so we're gonna use local parts of search model to actually use in the search. Um, and then it will say, resolution in many boxes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it'll do a, um, this local search that I described. Um, and then it might get some pretty good correlation between a small piece of the model, the or search model and part of the map. And then, and that'll identify a transformation that is appropriate for that. And then it'll take the whole model um, and apply that transformation to it. And then ask, um, how good is the correlation now? Well, it's actually pretty poor. Um, and then we refine the whole model um, with rigid body refinement. And that's what it's doing right now. And, oh, yeah, I have to load it up again. Um, so, it, and then it gets a new correlation after rigid body refinement, and that's higher. And this is the score that it'll actually use to score this um, rotation translation. And if this number is high, then it will quit. If it's not very high, then it will try again. And so now we're all done with that um, and we can open the whole thing. So it found the translation. In fact, it's just a, a pure translation. Rotation matrices are diagonals are one pretty much and the off diagonal ones are pretty much zero. So it just found this with the translation of 190, 147, 147. So it's pretty easy. Um, we can open that and coot. Might get tangled here with the other one. 
Let me turn that one off. Yeah. yeah, maybe that wasn't a good idea, huh? Try again. Let's see if there we go. Yeah, you can see my computer's pretty slow here. Let's see. Okay, so let's let me see if I can just open it and then we'll be done here. Open coordinates. Document map, place model at the beginning. Okay, there's my place model. And let's open the map. Okay, 750.map. Okay, so that worked pretty well. Um, and this is, yeah, I mean, symmetry related, not not real symmetry related thing. And uh, yeah, so this is fine, which once again is amazing because this is a crystal structure and it just plunks right into the cryo-EM structure. It's really quite astonishing. And um, this tutorial goes on and you refine it um, and you see that the refined value is still almost exactly the same as the original crystal structure, which is amazing. Of course, this yeah, relatively rigid molecule, but still quite astounding. Okay, um, I think we're done with all that. And uh, just if we have any more questions left. Great, thanks, Tom. Any any questions that people have? Uh, I see a hand up, Alejandro. <clears throat> yes. Do you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. A, quick, a quick question, Tom. Thank you very much for 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 everything. So, uh, coming back to the sequences, how to how to go about with the sequence files for, in the mapped model program. Mm -hmm. So, let's say you have a, a, a complex with many different proteins. And added to that, some of them you know about, some of them you just don't know. How do you deal with that in terms of, you know, the sequence files that you? Yeah. Should... So, um, yeah. So the bottom line is, if if you had a if you have a really good map, then um, the sequence files will be interpreted literally, and you could potentially identify the sequence of each piece in your map and put it all together the right way. This is very rare. So in practice, um, you can put in different things in that sequence file. It's not going to make a huge difference. Um, what matters is going to be kind of um, the total number of residues in the sequence file that matters. Um, because that kind of tells it how big the molecule is, and that's used in the original masking procedure, but it's still not essential. Um, then, so bottom line is this, if you have a multi subunit complex, just put in the sequence of all the different pieces that are there and just, just throw the whole thing in there and it will do something that's pretty, is, is do as well as it can. So it'll identify all the individual parts of the sequence. So it'll see, 
it'll, it'll analyze that sequence file and say, okay, I have five chains and they have these different relationships and there's three copies, this and two of that, whatever. And um, then it will try, then it, the sequence identification procedure at the end, um, it'll use all those possible sequences and choose the one that seems to fit the best. Um, but like I said, it, in realistic cases, um, big complexes, low resolution, you're often not going to get that sequence identified right anyways. So it doesn't make a huge difference. Right. Thank you. Okay. Actually, I make another comment on multi-protein complexes. So I mentioned that you can just throw the whole thing in there and map to model will do something with it. But as a practical matter, you know, I mean, if you're doing a bunch of things um, and you don't want to like focus on any particular thing, yeah, sure you can do that. But in a realistic case, you're not going to do that because you're really interested in this molecule and you want to get each part right, right? So what are you going to do? You're going to cut out chain, you know, Q um, from your big molecule and make a box around it. And then you're going to work on chain Q all by itself. And um, you're going to build your model into it. And, um, you know, map to model is going to build it maybe reasonably well, and, but maybe it's not going to be complete. You're going to have to do some work by hand, and maybe you're going to put it in there again. Maybe you can do some other program as well. And, um, you know, you're going to do that, and you may as well do that on a, a, a boxed model that's small so that you can you know, work on it relatively easily. And then you're going to go on to chain R, and you're just going to do all of them that way, right? And then you're going to put them all back together into one big molecule. Um, and then maybe you will refine the whole thing all together at the end. All right. Any other questions? Can we give this stoichiometry of each molecule in a multi-protein protein complex for docking? Um, actually, I don't remember whether you can do that for more than one. But you certainly can do that for one. You can say, uh, so if, if, if it's like, you know, three to two and you know, something like that, I don't think that's in there. I, I don't remember. It's possible, but I, I don't think so. Um, but if you have, um, you know, eight chains that are all the same um, and you want to just supply one molecule and have it put in all eight places, that's right there. That's easy. Yeah. And I think, Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, you can, you can run the the docking with one molecule uh, kind of molecule first place those and then add that in as a fixed molecule and when you try and dock the rest yes you can do that yeah you can also give a list of things you know dock this then that then that but actually i would do it the way paul just said it's um that way you you see the result of the first one you know it probably didn't work right the first time you try it five times and eventually you get it right and then you go on to the next molecule, next chain, and, and do that. So yeah, you can you can supply a fixed molecule, a fixed chains um, that will block off some part of the density, and so it won't try to put anything there, and it'll try to put it where else, wherever else it fits. Yeah. 